All right. Call the meeting to order. We'll do roll call. If you wouldn't just mind. Stork present. Thank you. Thoman here. Uh, Nicole Villanueva here. Kevin Boyd. Seligrin. Frank Wagner. Margaret Beck. All right. Public discussion of anything not on the agenda. I think you're here for something on the agenda. So we are ready to move on to um, this item D, staff presentation on the climate action plan progress. So I want to begin by thanking you very much for this invitation to come and speak with you this evening. I'm Sarah Gardner, the Climate Action Coordinator here in Iowa City, and uh, I'm going to give to you the same presentation essentially that we gave to City Council about uh, progress that's been made in the last three years in implementing the city's climate action goals. But um, I often find in these discussions that the questions you all bring are more interesting than any data I can trot out. So please don't hesitate to interrupt me at any point and ask any questions, I'm happy to hear what you have to say and have that conversation. So um, as you can see, this is a progress report and we can go to the next slide. Um, as you may or may not know, the city established a goal of reducing emissions 45% by 2030 and achieving net zero by 2050. And one of the great things I get to do in my role is say we are well on our way to achieving that first goal. Um, as you can see, we do annual greenhouse gas inventories that keep track of the the emission uh, sources across sectors here in Iowa City. And uh, in 2020, we actually achieved our 2030 goal a little early. Um, it went back up in 2021. And although, of course, my job is to help bring those emissions down, in this case, I'm actually a little pleased to see it go back up because that was actually an indicator of us coming out of the pandemic. Um, as you'll see, uh, we can see the impacts of the pandemic in several data points we maintain. So. I always tell folks, it tells me two things. One, that the goals we want to achieve are achievable. The pandemic actually gave us some important clues of some of the other levers we could be pulling to help bring it down. And now we have a chance to do it in a way that you know doesn't destabilize the economy. So that's, that's a win. Um, we'll go on to the next slide and I'll show you, I mentioned that we keep track of these emissions across sectors and here you can see them outlined. Um, and we can see that we've had reductions pretty steadily across the board, um, more, some larger reductions in the industrial and commercial and residential sector, um, a little less so in the UI power plant, although that is largely because they had already made such large strides to get off coal. So um, there are just a few remaining emissions to be addressed that actually will be diminished um, when they make the final conversion of their last boiler. And then you can see, um, especially in transportation, that little pandemic-related dip that came about in part because people were working remotely and now have started to return to the offices, so we see a rise in those emissions again. And then waste, um, and that's actually an important segment that I always like to point out in part because you know one of the common questions we get is uh, why are we a separate division from uh, resource management which handles recycling? Why do we spend so much ta time talking about energy usage and not as much time of talking about recycling in our work. And of course, there is overlap between the two, but you can see um, total emissions impact from our waste stream here in Iowa City only account for about 3% of our total emissions. Um, the overwhelming amount of emissions in the city come from our energy usage in our buildings, things that um, are related to heating and cooling and lighting and the electronic devices that allow me to bore you with this data tonight. Um, so it's just, a, it's just a, I think, an important point to drive home for that reason and also because often, you know, people come to us and when we say, you know, oh, what kinds of climate actions are you taking, the first thing they talk about is recycling. So an important part of our conversation is saying that is great. There's so many good reasons to do it. I myself was a recycling coordinator before coming to Iowa City, but there are other uh, larger interventions that we also need to be focusing on. Um, we can go to the next slide. So as I mentioned, uh, energy usage in our buildings is the largest source of emissions here in Iowa City. We are making strides to reduce it. You can see just in that three year period, um, we've taken the tons per capita in our residential structures down from just under three tons per capita. Um, we're now down to 2.3, and that's a pretty steady decline, which we're quite happy about. Um, the number one driver of that energy usage in our households is heating and cooling. Um, as you can see, 
see we further break that data down uh, by how much is electricity usage and how much of it is natural gas usage, which is methane by another name. And you can see that the fossil gas usage actually accounts for the largest share of that energy usage in those households. So for that reason, we have energy efficiency programs in the city, which are a core component of um, the work that our my office does. Um, and it's really focused on two things. One is reducing energy usage overall that has a number of benefits, not the least of which is helping keep costs low as we transition to clean energy sources because, of course, it costs less to buy or to build 100 wind turbines than it does to build 200. Um, and the other thing we do is talk a lot about electrification. How do we reduce that natural gas usage, right? Um, because natural gas will never get cleaner over time, it combusts you know, at the same and creates the same particulates and emissions. And that's just physics. Whereas electricity, we have cleaner and cleaner options to tap into. Um, and you can see this last figure, and this is the hard part about delivering reports. They're always out of date by the time you get around to publishing them. Um, we spent $80,000 last year on energy efficiency programs within residences in Iowa City, and that's largely through our energy efficiency grant programs, which um, provide at, uh, cover the cost in full of increasing attic insulation, um, as well as um, switching switching over to heat pumps and um, doing electrical panel upgrades in income qualified households. I'm quite happy to report that in the first quarter of this year, just from January to March, um, we spent over and above what we had spent the entire year before. So those programs are really starting to take off in a way that is um, just great. And part of that is because we've been doing some um, increased marketing around those programs, letting people know that they're qualified and we're here to help with them. If we go to the next slide, um, you can see one of the ways that we've um, traditionally engaged with households is performing energy audits in Iowa City households, and you don't have to be income qualified to receive this. We have AmeriCorps members who are trained um, to go in and perform a blower door test and help identify areas of uh, air loss, essentially, which translates into heat loss in homes, and then they can provide weatherization services while they're still there in the home. And in fact, if a home has received a home energy audit, there's nothing preventing them from going through it again. The AmeriCorps team will come back, and if there's any weatherization that needs to be shored up, they'll do it at that time. So we have a great team of AmeriCorps members who've been helping us with that work, and they've uh, been able to increase the number of houses they reach year over year. We also, in the last three years, have begun what we call our neighborhood energy blitzes, where we go into households. Maybe some of you maybe have received um, a kit through this program, but it's a always held on Earth Day or the Saturday right after, and we uh, take a targeted neighborhood and we go door to door deliver, delivering kits that contain energy saving devices like LED light bulbs and furnace whistles, and oddly the most uh, popular item in it is our sand shower timers, which just help people be a little more aware of how long they uh, are in the shower, which I'm told is, <laughs> I was saying how funny it is that that's most popular, and then somebody said to me, there are a lot of teenagers in Iowa City. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then in the afternoon, we come back and we collect um, used light bulbs and used batteries. We tell folks to take the items out of the kit and put their used light bulbs and batteries in, and we come back and collect them. Our most recent event actually was just last month, and we collected over 120 pounds of material that way to be uh, recycled. About 80 of it pounds were batteries, um, and then the remaining 40 pounds were light bulbs, which is a lot of light bulbs when you consider how lightweight they are. Um, if we go to the next slide, we can talk about how we don't, of course, just focus on houses. We also have grants for um, commercial and industrial entities to help decrease energy usage there. If you look at the way the data breaks down, it's a little different from the way it did for the residential energy, which you may recall the lion's share was natural gas usage. For our commercial and industrial entities, it's largely electricity usage that's driving those emissions. And so for this reason, um, for these entities, we, again, focus on energy efficiency, but we also um, incorporate some clean energy interventions. And so through that program, we've been able to put solar panels on a number of businesses. But we've also done things like um, in, 
switch over LED lighting. It's actually surprising um, how many businesses haven't done that yet. Um, and we even had a really interesting um, pro uh, project recently with uh, Procter & Gamble that replaced um, a air compressor um, that moved units along one of their production lines. And that realized huge energy efficiency gains. So it's always something to learn, I find. That's one of the things I really like about this work. Um, on the next page, you'll see we also have grants for um, for organizations and um, in and nonprofits, largely here in Iowa City, to pursue um, or to pursue their own climate action projects related to the climate action goals. Um, Increasingly, year over year, we're seeing more of those projects come in that are focused on buildings and energy, which we like to see because that tells us the message is getting out, that those are the interventions we need. I mean, there's just one on this slide that I want to call your attention to because I think it would be of particular interest to this group. And that is a grant that um, was given to Public Space One last year. Uh, it's very hard to read, but basically we paid for um, to help in two of the historic buildings they occupy here in downtown to um, help rebuild sashes and reglaze the windows. And as in partnership with that, in return for getting the grant, they agreed to host um, workshops to help area homeowners gain those skills as well. And the workshops were so popular that originally we had just asked them to do two of them, but they ended up scheduling an additional class to meet the needs. So that was very exciting to hear. Um, on the next page, then, you'll see, finally, I can stop talking about buildings and talk a little about the work we're doing with transportation. Um, one of the big goals in the Climate Action Plan is to increase tri transit ridership. It actually calls for us to double transit ridership um, over our 2018 levels. This is one of the areas where you can really begin to see the impact of the pandemic. Um, and in fact, it's one of the most lasting impacts. We had transit ridership drop off dramatically at the beginning of the pandemic for very understandable reasons. Um, but this is one of the areas where it's never fully recovered. And so one of the challenges we have in the coming years is that whereas before we were talking about doubling our transit ridership, now we're really looking at um, tripling it. It's a taller, yes? Um, weren't some of the routes Cut though, like I feel like there was a there was a route on First Avenue that went past the high school, that was I think it was eliminated completely at, like during the pandemic. So that might be part of it. There were some routes that were reconfigured. Um, we're actually our routes now as they're configured are able to cover a wider area in Iowa City. And I'm a little embarrassed to say this. I was a bit of a skeptic. My own transit route was one of the ones that was rerouted to go out actually into Windsor Heights. And I thought, I don't know who's going to be getting on the bus out there. But actually, we've picked up a number of riders. And some of the actually exciting developments that you may have seen um, a press release go out just, I think it was late last week or early this week that two of our routes are now going from 30 minute service to 20 minute service, which is huge. Um, yeah. My uh, partner jokes that one of my hobbies is missing the bus. And when I told him now it's going to come every 20 minutes, he's like, time to get a new hobby. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I have one more yeah. comment, which is that um, they go that it the transit ends so early. I think it's like 730 on the weekends or something like that. I'm uh, I, it's probably a question better fielded by our transit director. I'm not quite clear myself on when it ends on the weekend service. I'm very aware that I need to catch the 8 o'clock bus to get home myself. Mm -hmm. um, but it is something that they conducted a transit study on and are looking to address. Um, and I will say one of the other things that uh, she'll be bringing before city council, actually later this month, is piloting free fare on the buses, which I think will also make a difference. I will say there's one note of hope here, and it doesn't quite show up. Well, it does, actually. If you look at the pie chart, um, when we look at where we were at in 2018 and where we are now, um, our transit ridership was reduced down to 3% of the total mode share here in Iowa City. But almost all of that reduction went to work from home. So from a climate perspective, it actually may be an even trade, right? Those folks aren't out driving. Um, instead of riding the bus, they're just working from home. And in some ways, 
um, that could possibly create more capacity on those buses because now we have more empty seats to hopefully try to get the folks who are driving alone to think about taking the bus instead. But of course, um, one of the things we talk about n all the time in our office is that there's no one silver bullet that's going to solve climate change. What we need is silver buckshot. And so we're big fans of all of the above strategies, right? Like we want to increase transit ridership, but we also want to increase walking and biking. And we really want to advocate for electric vehicles, which again, um, switches over to a cleaner form of um, lower form of emissions um, for our vehicles. In fact, if we go to the next slide, you can see um, one of the things we've done is begun actually switching over to electric vehicles here in City Hall. You may have seen the electric buses going around town. That's very exciting. We continue to pursue grants and other funding strategies to add electric, more electric buses to the fleet. Um, but we've also begun transitioning out the light duty vehicles that city staff use. And um, I can tell you my personal favorite is car number 64. It's a Nissan Leaf. I always get excited when it's in the parking stall and I can check it out. Um, and in fact, we're getting ready our, in, within our office to um, begin working with contractors to develop a fleet transition plan for the entirety of the city fleet. So it won't just be light duty vehicles, but we're looking ahead to what other kinds of heavy duty vehicles could be reasonably converted to electricity going forward with some exciting possibilities already showing up with electric dump trucks and electric fire trucks. So hopefully those electric buses are going to have some other big brothers out on the street and so Sisters. I shouldn't genderize trucks. <laughs> you <know? laughs> um, if you go to the next page, then you can also see that um, not just among city staff, but here in Iowa City, there's increasing demand for electric vehicles. This uh, bar chart or this line graph on the left is actually um, keeps track of the number of unique users at our electric charging stations in the public ramps here in Iowa City. And here too, you can see a dip that came about as a result of the pandemic. At the beginning of the pandemic, we had fewer people coming downtown, so we had fewer people using those charging stations. But unlike transit, this one has come roaring back. Um, we used to publish in our sustainability newsletter um, every time we surpassed a previous record on uh, electric vehicle charging use in the city, but we stopped doing it because we just keep breaking the record month after month, which is really exciting. Um, that fleet transition plan I mentioned actually comes on the heels of an electric vehicle readiness plan that uh, we had worked on about two years prior. And one of the interesting findings of that was that um, to really tip the, tip the scales toward electric vehicle adoption, municipalities need about 450 charging points per million people. We don't have a million people here in Iowa City, um, so we had to adjust that number downward to find out where we were at. But when we did, we found out that at the time, we were already right at 450 charge points per million. And since then, we've actually risen to 650 charge points per million equivalent is such a big number. Um, but I find it actually easier just to look at the map, um, which shows all the different charging stations that are in our area. The green uh, items on that map, or the green icons, are the level two charging stations. Those are the kinds you find in the parking ramp um, across the street. And then the orange ones are what are known as DC fast chargers. And those are the charging stations that are able to take a battery that's been fully depleted to fully topped off within 40 minutes. Um, you need, really need both in a community, right? Those super fast ones um, particularly serve interstate travel very well, so it allows us to continue um, functioning as an interstate served community. But uh, the level two ones actually um, serve local residents much more. And so we're really proud to have such a robust network. We actually have one of the most robust networks in the, in the state, which is great. Um, if we go to the next slide. I have a question. About oh, yeah. The Fire away. Um, do you know how they work or how they pay, how you pay for them? For the charging stations? Yeah. Um, right now and through the end of June, they are free in our parking ramps, the ones that the city owns. The state a few years ago passed legislation um, saying that starting July 1st of 2023, um, all stations that aren't serving residences need to start uh, assessing a 2.6 cent per kilowatt hour tax on vehicles. So when that tax goes into effect in July, we'll start charging a per kilowatt.
kilowatt hour fee at those stations to recoup the tax to be able to pay it to the state. But I will say um, one of the things that I'm especially proud of in Iowa City is thinking ahead to that tax and also thinking about how electric vehicles actually get used by the people who own them. We know um, the data is pretty clear that 80% of charging actually happens at home. It doesn't happen publicly. That public charging is important for like peace of mind. You know, you're not going to be driving around and not have a way of recharging your vehicle. But the benefits to drivers are really charging at home. And now even more so because if you charge at home, you won't have to pay that tax. And so Iowa City, um, as part of our EV readiness study, actually engaged with landlords to talk about what can we do to help get charging stations located at multifamily residences so that renters are able to have the same kind of a convenience in using EVs and not disproportionately paying the tax by being forced to charge at public charging stations. And actually, um, just last month, we signed our very first contract with a, um, it, it's not an apartment, it's a condo association, but even so, we're happy to be working with them to put in electric vehicle charging capacity for their residents. Hopefully, it's the first of many. Any well, other questions? Yeah, just to follow up on yeah. that. Um, it's interesting to hear that stat about 80% is uh, the number. But I would argue that having more accessible charging stations is a key to the EV movement expanding. Mm -hmm. uh, just with that in mind, um, you know, if you're traveling and all that, I, I've heard anecdotal stories of just people hanging out at charging stations. And so that's, that's curious, you know, how that's going to be handled going forth. And I, I think more charging stations, public access is, is great and needed. Oh, absolutely. You know, here again, it's another example of the all of, all of the above strategy, right? We're working with, um, we're working with the multifamily units to try to get charging established at those rental units. Um, part of our energy efficiency program, I mentioned, I think I mentioned, we also um, help cover the cost of electric panel upgrades. And that is um, to do two things. One, to make those homes EV ready so that when they choose to purchase a, an electric vehicle or if they choose to purchase it, they'll have the electric capacity for it. But it also serves a resilience goal because when we upgrade that electric infrastructure, particularly um, at our lower moderate income households. It involves undergrounding the service lines, um, which makes them less prone to disruption during storms. Um, and then, you know, we've got that residential component, but we also continue to pursue installing additional charging stations at our public um, public ramps, although we've shifted more of those resources toward the residential um, uh, programs, in part because we are over and, over and above what we've been told is the tipping point, and in part because we really want to enable people to be able to access that, you know, where they live to the extent possible which is great. Anything else? All right. I'm just going to touch on these next two very lightly because, as I mentioned, we don't do a lot of work with waste, but we do um, work in collaboration with our resource management staff on recycling initiatives. Um, the one that we most often partner with are initiatives to decrease food waste and organic material being sent to the landfill because, of course, the emissions that come from the landfill are from organic material that is breaking down in an anaerobic environment and creating methane, which we would rather not have. Um, we also are working on programs to divert construction and demolition waste. Um, in fact, right before I came up to this meeting, I got an email from Jen Jordan, our um, landfill superintendent, who um, was, was very excited to say that a partnership that had been focused on construction and demolition waste, which had sort of petered out, um, it seems like there's another company now that's interested in partnering with Iowa City on that. So that's a very exciting development. And I'm looking forward to calling her in the morning and learning more. Um, and then we also talk about reducing single-use plastics. Um, Jane Wilch and I, um, my recycling coordinator counterpart, actually just hosted 
um, a really lovely discussion at Big Grove um, two weeks ago where we invited people to come and we talked about the difficulties in recycling plastics, the challenges we face, and how reducing actually is a more effective strategy than reusing. Um, and I have to say, the weather was so beautiful, I thought there's no way anybody is going to come and sit around and talk with us about a topic as depressing as plastics. But <laughs> it was a full room and a lively conversation, which just goes to show how engaged this community is with issues like this. Oh, I'm sorry I missed it. <laughs> well, if you'd like to buy me a beer, I can recreate <laughs> it anytime. <laughs> Um, and then, of course, we help support other recycling initiatives, including recycling more paper, glass, and metal. Um, I did want to call out, because I know this is something that's of concern to a historic preservation community at large, and I, I'm going to go out on a limb and say it's of interest to you, too. Um, we did uh, work with our resource management staff to look more closely at the numbers of the most recent waste characterization study. And the lion's share of these items, you can see organics accounts for about 24% of what goes to the landfill, so that's the part that's top of mind for us. Um, you can see all these other wedges then that go over and around the top really have to do with, um, largely with consumer products of different forms. There's a consumer product category, but then there's also paper and plastic, and we think of those as consumer products as well. And then there's construction and demolition debris, which accounts for about 18% of what's going to the landfill. Phil. Um, but that, I think, can be a kind of misleading term, um, because when you look at it and further break it down, um, the largest share of that um, is, is made up by furniture going to the landfill, which is not something I think of as construction and demolition debris. Um, and I, don't, I, can, I can't tell since finding that out if I find that disheartening or encouraging, right? On the one hand, I can't believe we're sending that much furniture to the landfill. It accounts for about 4% um, of our waste stream, which is not, I mean, it's small, but it's, that's significant. Um, on the other hand, doesn't it feel like furniture is something that we could address? You know, we have such a robust network of uh, reuse stores and organizations like Houses into Homes. Um, and in fact, I know that Jane Wilch um, recently pivoted from hosting what used to be called Rummage on the Ramp to what she called her drop-off donation events. And through the drop-off donation events, she was able to divert one ton of material from the landfill for every hour that the event was going on, which was just leaps and bounds above actually what happened during Rummage on the Ramp. So she's planning on hosting that event again, or a series of events again this summer as students move out and move into apartments. So um, hopefully that will help to continue address that particular waste stream. Um, if we go to the next slide, then you'll see, I had mentioned when we were at Big Grove, one of the things we talked about is how reuse is a more effective strategy than recycling, and that's for a lot of reasons, right? Recycling's great, but it does use energy, um, and it does generate uh, emissions in transporting the material to and from the places it needs to go in order to be recycled. And so, um, you can see that it's encouraging that both recycling and organics um, diversion grew um, during the course of the pandemic, but so did the tonnage of material being sent to the landfill. So it's not a problem we're going to recycle our way out of, right? We have to talk about reuse and reduction overall. Um, and I will say here too, this may be a bit of a pandemic impact, that one of the things we saw during that time change in the waste stream is a lot more disposable items going to the landfill particularly early on in the pandemic when it was seen as a sanitary issue. I'm told there's an unbelievable number of masks that went to the landfill, which I actually can believe. Um, and actually, we had to get a little more aggressive about our cardboard ban because so many people were ordering so much more from Amazon um, and you know other online stores. I don't mean to call out one in particular. Although, I will say a dock manager for Amazon rides my bus, and he has told me that on average in Iowa City, there are 25,000 deliveries a day made in our area out of that hub, which is just a stunning amount of material. All right. We'll move on to a more cheerful slide. <laughs> Ooh, or not. <laughs> yeah, so um, the Climate Action Plan, one of the things that's unique about Iowa City's plan is it's not just a climate action plan that looks at lowering emissions. It also recognizes that there are some climate impacts we're already experiencing in Iowa City and realistically will continue to experience for decades to come until we're able to stabilize the climate. 
Um, and so it's, it also includes an adaptation section. What do we need to do to prepare for those impacts, which include higher heat events and heavier rainstorms, which I think we've all can experience, attest to having experienced. Um, one of the projects that we've worked on actually early in my tenure at Iowa City was looking at the tree canopy and um, the ecosystem benefits of it to the city. And so what you see here is a high level heat map that shows um, how heat is unevenly distributed across the city. So those red areas are areas where on a high heat day, um, the temperature on those streets is between eight to 11 uh, degrees higher than it is um, in the yellow areas. And there's some sort of faint, they, on this screen they look kind of gray. Um, they should look sort of green or blue. Those are areas where the temperature can be five to six degrees lower. Um, and not surprisingly, when we go to the next slide, you'll see that those areas correspond Respond with the highest concentrations of tree canopy, right? Now, all of this data is LIDAR data, which is data that's gathered by satellites. It's actually above my pay grade to understand exactly how it works. Um, but it sort of gives us that high level view of where the heat disparities are. This summer, um, we're actually uh, got a grant from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration to be one of about 15 cities nationally to engage in a citizen science science project where we're going to be equipping residents here in Iowa City with heat sensing devices to get us a ground level data about the heat disparities. So on one of the highest heat days of the year, we'll um, be sending out volunteers with these devices on their vehicles with a navigator to collect data three times along a prescri prescribed route um, over the course of a day. And that's going to give us a much better ground level sense of where the heat disparities are. And in particular, this LIDAR data we're looking at was taken before the derecho. The citizen science gathered data is going to give us a better picture of what the impacts were um, resulting from our loss of tree canopy. And we're doing this in collaboration with Cedar Rapids, which is really wonderful. Um, it's actually the first step towards a larger initiative to develop a corridor climate action plan um, in collaboration with our cities, um, in part because you know one of the other things I talk about is if Iowa City did every single thing right, if we stopped emitting tomorrow any greenhouse gases, it wouldn't do us any good if all the other areas around us continue to generate emissions, right? So those um, collaborations across jurisdictions, I think, are going to become increasingly critical, especially as we get closer and closer to our own goals. All right, just a few more slides, I promise. Um, a, one of the things... We had, a, we had a question, I think, in that last... Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. sorry. No, I was just wondering if you have enough volunteers for the Citizen Science <laughs> Project. We don't. Please volunteer. How do we find out? We, um, it's, uh, so we have a website set up for it. It's called icgov.org slash spot the hot, which is right. the name of the initiative. Um, we actually have a part of the reason we don't have a, a lot of volunteers just yet is we haven't begun really aggressively recruiting them. We don't exactly have our date from the National Weather Service as to when we'll likely be collecting data. But we do have a kickoff event scheduled for Mercer Park on June 10th. Um, and we're collaborating with the county public health department to just highlight why identifying heat impacts are so necessary. You know, I, when we think of climate change, I think we tend to think about the extreme weather events like the derecho that happened. Um, the derecho was terrible. Like, it was terrible for uh, so many reasons, but nobody died in the derecho, whereas there are high heat related deaths year after year. One of the uh, future impacts projected for our area is to go from about nine days a year over 90 degrees in Iowa City to 90 days a year over 90 degrees. Um, and so getting out ahead of that heat, understanding where the most vulnerable parts of our community are and what we can be doing to um, begin building up our resilience to that. You know, it takes a long time to grow trees. We really need to know where we need to be planting them now. Um, so I don't, that didn't seem so cheery, but it will be a fun event. There will be a sponge toss. I know that for sure. <laughs> um, so I encourage you to come. It'll be really great. And yes, please do sign up. We would love to have you. Um, be a scientist for a day. Any other questions? All right. 
Um, so I'm just going to touch lightly on some of the other community initiatives that we've had going on. This first one I, is very near and dear to my heart, in part because I actually was just writing about this today. When I first started uh, uh, working in Iowa City, you know, this is an issue, climate change, that we feel like youth are very engaged with, and they are. But I was struck by how many youth I was speaking to in the community who were saying, you know, this is a critical issue, but it's all in the hands of big corporations. There's nothing we can really do to make a meaningful difference. Um, and I think I actually reached a breaking point with it when an intern in our own office said that, that he had been interested in working in climate but didn't think he could stare it in the face every day. And so he went off to do other work. Um, and so with thinking about this, we came up with a program we called the Climate Resilience Corps, which involves um, taking area youth and training them um, on the projected impacts of climate change in our area, but also providing change on how to effectively talk with other people about climate change and hear what their concerns are, right, to make it a real dialogue. And those youth are then charged with going out and going door to door in a two block neighborhood in their uh, two block area in their own neighborhood. Because one of the other things we know from events like the derecho is the thing that makes the most difference in your comfort and well-being following an extreme weather event is neighbors checking on you, right? Knowing your neighbors. Um, and this is actually, I find this very interesting. You probably do too. The change in American society that has corresponded with moving away from things like houses that have front porches, you know, as a re I, an indirect result, I would say, um, fewer and fewer people know their neighbors. At the beginning of the century, most people knew most people who lived on their block. Now people average knowing about three or four neighbors on their block. So we asked these youth to go out and talk to everybody who lived in a two block area and ask them like, what concerned them about climate change? What um, was difficult in their homes after the derecho or after a high rain event? Do they worry about flooding in their basement? Do they struggle to keep their houses cool in high heat events? And the youth came back and they created this really wonderful zine that included information that they thought was most useful to their neighbors based on those conversations they had. And it had things like information about different city resources, projected impacts, um, things that uh, homes could do to build their own resilience kits. And then the youth themselves built resilient starter packs um, that included things like uh, a solar powered phone charger, which I thought was so cool. Um, and they put that in the kit specifically because one of the things they heard from neighbors is that after the derecho, they struggled when the power was out to keep their phones charged to keep in touch with their family members, right? So um, they put these kits together and they went back out into the neighborhood and they delivered the kits to those same households that they had spoken to in the two block area. And it was just a really great experience, I think, for the youth and for us, you know, to have that opportunity to empower them to take real meaningful change within their own neighborhoods and help us increase the resilience here in Iowa City. Um, so the next slide, I believe, just talks about some other ways that we work to engage um, residents here in Iowa City. One of them, we uh, have a newsletter, actually, that goes out every month that highlights climate activity. We've got a lot of different things going on, so we like to let people know exactly what it is, ways they can be involved, other resources that they could be accessing for their homes and businesses. Um, and you can see, uh, it's kind of hard to see that pie chart, but we keep track of the messaging by topic as a pretty balanced newsletter newsletter. We, of course, like to talk about buildings and energy all the time. We know that's not what everybody else wants to talk about all the time. So um, it does feature things like recycling resources, transportation events, um, upcoming just sustainability topics in general. Um, and you can see our subscribers have continued to grow since that newsletter was first instituted in uh, 2018, which is really nice. And it recently got rebranded. So now it has this... I, I don't know, I really like this header. It's got um, Goldie, which is our climate action mascot that we rolled out in the last year. Um, one of the great things about Goldie is, again, because we're look, chasing silver buckshot, it can be difficult to indicate, like, this is a climate action, right? This and the 15 other things we're talking about. So um, just being able to have a mascot to put on it has helped us with that branding a little. Um, but also... One of the most startling statistics we collected Shooting in the Goldie last year. With the buckshot? <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, 
We did, we did put Goldie, though, to work on our insulation campaign, our insulation program. And when we rolled out the associated marketing collateral, participation in that program increased 650%, which uh, just tells me I should let a cartoon bird come up here and speak to you instead of me. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that's the last slide. I think, oh, no. Uh, just another slide talking about what comes next. Um, I already mentioned the Citizen Science Project we're going to be doing this summer. This is a, that picture on the left actually is one of the heat collecting devices that was affixed to a car in another city that collected the data last year. Um, next to it, it's kind of difficult to make out, but of course one of the things we've been fielding a lot of questions about in recent months is um, incentives under the IRA and how they can be put to good use um, for Iowa City and for its residents. And so one of the things we did um, was boil down all the rebates and all the tax incentives that are out there for weatherization and for um, home energy systems. And we took a look at the income caps and the annual expenditure caps under each program, and we came up with a 10-year strategy for Iowa City residents to say, if you want to maximize your benefits under this program, this is what you do first, this is what you do in the next two to three years, this is what you do when it breaks down. Um, so for example, when your air conditioning unit goes out, what do you replace it with, and what are the tax rebates and incentives available to help with that purchase, and then what do you want to do by the end of the 10 years? Um, and so we've just begun going out into the community and talking about this, and we have this great um, uh, checklist that we've developed that we've been distributing at part of these talks so that folks know what to do. Um, and then you can see on the far right, it's, I wouldn't be surprised if you don't recognize what it is. I had actually, when I was looking at it, I was like, what is this a diagram of again? Yes, it's the Public Works Department, um, which is going to be the site of a solar installation going in later this year. So we're also continuing to pursue clean energy, energy strategies for municipal buildings as well. Um, after we get this array up on the Public Works building, um, we'll be putting in an array at the airport next, which is really exciting. I think that, I'm going to jinx myself. Yes, it was the last slide. <laughs> Are there any other questions I can answer? I just was really struck by your comment too about kind of the reuse of things because recycling, we're not going to recycle our way out of these things mm -hmm. and the transportation cost of those things. And I, I you know, I'm, I'm particularly concerned about construction waste generally just because I, I often think people are like, you know, the, the city, the, per, the permit for a demolition is 20 bucks, $100, right? Mm -hmm. It's not. And what they're contributing to the waste is significantly more than that cost, mm. right? It seems like a, a very easy way to capture some more of the cost of de demolishing things and putting it to good use to help existing buildings. You know, it's a, it's a revenue stream, but also a disincentive to demolish something without really a plan of what goes in place. Because, you know, you look at the building across the street, they demolished it, it's sitting empty, the lot is sitting empty, not not a productive use, but whatever's going to get built there, even if it's the greenest building, the transportation costs of all of those materials is going to, like, it's going to be generations before that's recaptured. And that's true. I, so what I hear you saying, I think you're talking about embodied carbon in yeah. buildings. Yeah. Um, I actually did a back of the envelope calculation myself on this to figure out um, how long a building needs to be in place before energy inefficiencies for that building catch up with it. And this is like a devilishly hard calculation to do, mm -hmm. right? Because building technologies are always changing, efficiencies are always changing, but um, a very rough metric, if you think about replacing a building one for one um, with the materials now, um, it would take about 70 years to catch up, right? Um, part of what makes that calculation really difficult is we very rarely replace buildings one for one, right? It's far less, it's, uh, buildings are demolished far less often than they're rehabbed, right? And so one of the things I think about a lot are, um, I mean, I, I do think about the exterior of the building, and I should say, I'm a little out over my skis on this one. It's not my, you know, it's resource management that really manages all this, but um, 
one of uh, one of the things I think about a lot is how much of that construction and demolition debris are things like kitchen cabinets getting redone over and over and carpet being pulled up, which of course is a petroleum derivative, right? Um, and that furniture again, like you're far more likely to change a couch in the next 15 to 20 years than you are to demolish an entire building, right? And so I think, uh, to your point, I think it's, it's an excellent suggestion that we want to be very thoughtful about the costs um, we're charging for people to send things to the landfill because a landfill is forever. And if you're only paying $20, that's pretty cheap rent for forever, right? Um, but I think we also need to be engaging a lot of those um, consumer decisions that have a higher degree of turnover. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Yeah, I was just thinking, um, in terms of this turnover of goods, I don't suppose there's any realistic way to figure out, for example, of the furniture that goes to the landfill, how much of it is genuinely still usable with declines in quality across all kinds of material goods. I, yes, I think that is difficult data to collect. Um, I can't offer you solid numbers on it, but I can say, as we've gone around the community, it's funny, as we've gone around the community and talked to landlords about putting electric vehicles in place, um, the biggest thing landlords have wanted to talk to us about is move out season with their students because what they have um, is a, a high percentage of a student population that establishes an apartment in Iowa City and then leaves the apartment fully furnished and it falls to the landlord to clear it out. I'm going to go out on a limb and assume a lot of that furniture is still usable, with the exception, and I think this is always like the difficulty, right? Like furniture today is not like furniture 40 years ago, right? Like IKEA furniture, there are moving companies that won't even move it um, to a second location because it's so likely to fall apart and they don't want the liability. So I think. And if, if, if you have great ideas, I mean, I would really love to hear your thoughts on this. Like, how do we encourage the purchase of more durable goods that are meant to be reused over and over and to stand up in the test of time? I just wanted to comment, Dee, about kind of tying to what you said about maybe having a higher fee. I do demolition mm -hmm. constantly on old buildings. And, but I recite, I mean, I reuse mm -hmm. more, not a, an ounce of metal goes into the landfill, it gets recycled. Every piece of wood either gets reused or gets recycled. Mm -hmm. And I go to great lengths, I and mean, then if you want to get yourself worked up, go to the landfill, which I go a lot. Mm -hmm. And I, I hate going back to the pit, because they make you go because I dump trailer, with this really, really stuff that cannot be reused. Mm -hmm. And I was there a week ago, and there's a giant sign at the landfill that says, Car, no cardboard in the landfill. So I'm out there watching one 30-yard dumpster roll off coming in and out, and I'm dumping my thoughtfully selected stuff for the landfill. And I'm watching this one construction dumpster get dumped. They're dumping all this wood. That was, I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm putting it in my truck as oh. I take mm -hmm. it out. Mm -hmm. And then another truck then comes in, and they're dumping 50 five-gallon buckets from a painting job. And I'm like, why are you burying that? And I wave the guy down. Can I have those? Because when I'm taking my plaster out, five-gallon buckets are perfect for that. Then the kicker was a 30-yard dumpster rolls up, pushes out complete load of cardboard. Wow. And I'm staying there shaking my head. Go back to the station to weigh out, and I said to the woman there, I said, I don't want to be a squeal, a narc or anything, but that truck right there just dumped 30-yard container of cardboard in the landfill. She says, oh, wait, we know. We find him. And I said, well, what's the find? Double the fee. Mm -hmm. Well, cardboard doesn't weigh anything to begin with. Mm -hmm. And I thought, no, they should make him go back out, pick it up, and find him at $500 or something. Teeth. Yeah, yeah. Well, like some, I mean, some real fines. And that's the thing. I mean, it was. And then she said, well, he didn't. He just was probably delivering the load. You know, his ABC disposal. He didn't know what was in it. Then they better find out what's in it because, I mean, it, I about fell over. Yeah. So that's just my two but, cents. 
Well, thank you so much for your work and, and actually, your conscientious reuse of materials. Who's the Je Jen Jordan? Yeah, I was going to say I want to be a good Je colleague and not no she speak for another department. I, I but I think one time because I know that they when you can recycle wood and previous to her having holding that position, I would take all the lath from an old building and put it in a big pile because you got an option you could burn it or buried at the landfill, but then I said, you know, it's really, it's clean wood. You can chop it up and make it into mulch. Mm -hmm. And the first person said, nope, it's dirty. You can't do that. And then I c spoke with her and I said, hey, it's really, it's just wood. I said, fine. And that gets chopped up. Now I can take lath to the landfill. Mm. Yeah, I actually recycle. highly recommend bringing Jen Jordan in to speak with you if you haven't done so recently. Like, um, I'll, I'll say as somebody who, of course, is very concerned with sustainability and not just climate, even though a lot of my work obviously is focused on climate, um, but also as a former recycling coordinator myself, like I'm just so impressed with Jen Jordan and I've how like her commitment to creative solutions. Like I, I can vouch for having worked in communities where things that would be considered just a dead end, like Jen is, Jen does not see them that way. She's always looking for those solutions and new partnerships. So um, it, it, I think you're right. Going to the landfill is disheartening. Um, I think part of the reason I'm not a recycling coordinator anymore is like, that is, it is hard <laughs> to feel good about humanity looking at a landfill every day. But um, Jen's amazing. I think you would really enjoy speaking with her. And Sherry, I'm sure she'd be very interested in the ideas you have to share, including how we can right size fees. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's, I appreciate that. One, one other thing, too, that you know, you talked about how furniture was just built more durably a generation ago. The same is true for houses, right? I mean, mm -hmm. homes that were built pre-World War II generally, right, have a, were just built differently. They were built to be maintained and restored by the, the mm -hmm. owner for generations, right? We, many of us live in those houses and, and see that, you know, I, I, my aunt and uncle are realtors and every time they come over, like, I can't believe this house is this old. You know, it just feels sturdy to them and some of the stuff they, they sell doesn't. And, but I, but I also am mindful of, you know, I feel like a lot of the, and this I, I don't I don't know what's in the kits that you all are providing, but I've I, I've done this before with Mid America or somebody. I feel like they the often the kits that come are designed for houses built post World War II. You know, it's like put this here, do this. This is what this looks like, and it, it just the treatment is different in these older houses. And I'm just curious if you guys have thought about that, have addressed that, like. You know, I mean, even like the weather stripping and, you know, the windows, you know, there's, it's, you could cut channels in and put, you know, there's just, there's things you can do that are um, a little trickier. I tried to weather strip my back door with like the, mm -hmm. it's not copper, the bronze. I like, mm -hmm. I, I'm not a very patient person. <laughs> So I gave up on that. I've started like three times. I've ordered like three different kits. And I feel bad that all of them ended up in the like in the landfill because there's no I failed at them. But uh, <laughs> just, I'm not I'm not good at that kind of stuff. But um, but I'm just curious how you guys approach that or think about that as you guys are you know thinking about they're just different. There's different challenges, different different things. A lot of them don't have you know central air. You mm -hmm. know they obviously were just like not a thing um, when they were built. And you know there are there. Have you thought about how to approach that? Are there opportunities for us or other people who have thought about it in older homes to engage and be partners on that? I guess, you know, really is what I'm trying to kind of think about. Um, anyway, I'll stop talking and let you talk, and then I've got a couple of my luck. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate the thoughtfulness of the question so much. Um, I, will, I will say the things that go into our kits because we're going to an entire neighborhood in one day, they have to be pretty generally yeah. applicable, right? Um, and so I'd mentioned they have things like LED light bulbs. Um, they have the sh sand shower timer. Um, they have a furnace whistle, which is probably the least universally applicable item in the kit. Not everybody has um, a furnace filter that it works with, but we nonetheless include it as just a way to message around the importance of changing your furnace filter regularly. Um, and then we provide information that, um, including now that IRA checklist that we hope will equip homeowners to make the decisions that are right for their properties. Um, 
we did talk about including weather stripping, but ultimately decided against it because of part of you know the issue, exact issue that you've identified. Um, instead, what we try to do is encourage people to engage the AmeriCorps team to come in because they will do that weather stripping and have training to do so, um, hopefully a little more successfully than I would do myself, I will say. Um, I guess also yeah. the AmeriCorps, AmeriCorps folks, do they, do they approach properties differently? Are they, do they have training in older homes too? Or? Oh, oh, sure. Well, they have, um, so the training they get, and I actually am very proud of this, they um, are BPI, Building Professional Institute, certified in the work that they do. They go through um, extensive training actually before they come to Iowa City. And the thing I'm proud of is that in Iowa, um, when you have a Green Iowa AmeriCorps team, two of the members get that training, and then you have three that don't. And um, Iowa City has committed over the last several years um, to make sure that every member of the team has that training, partly so that we're able to reach more homes with the team. We have more hands able to do the work and so that they're able to learn from each other, right? Um, and hopefully carry that knowledge forward because we never know which member is gonna stick with us for a second year and which is not. But we also see it actually as a green jobs initiative that the number one resume builder for people on those AmeriCorps teams is having that professional certification. Um, they, they, I, I don't know, and I'd be happy to find out the extent to which they're trained specifically on older homes, but I can say having been out with them myself, I've been very impressed with the breadth of their knowledge and the way they do approach each home as its own entity. They don't go in and, you know, with a checklist, like we're just gonna do these things. So they really do take a thoughtful approach where they're looking for the air leaks, they're talking to the homeowners about what other interventions are available to them. And I have, um, in the times I've been out with them, seen them, um, for example, you know, talk about the importance of good insulation in your attic, good insulation in your basement and crawl space next, which I was quite happy to, I will say part of my preparation for tonight was reading the handbook that um, has put out by you all, I assume, for historic preservation here. And it was really nice to see how much this messaging aligns, right? And then they get questioned sometimes about, well, what about insulation in walls? And I've been really impressed to see them say, you know, the payback for wall insulation insulation isn't the same as it is for attics and basements. And there may be special considerations for your home, like wanting to preserve your siding, right? Um, if you have historically relevant siding, probably increasing wall, in wall insulation is not going to be an intervention you want to pursue for this particular property. Let's talk about other things you could be doing. Yeah. I'm not a landlord, and I don't know what the process of getting a rental permit is like, but are there any standards that the property has to meet? I'm thinking specifically of things around energy efficiency. I mean, is it a way to encourage landlords to do things, or...? Um, there is, in in the Climate Action Plan, there is an item um, calling for us to try to increase energy efficiency requirements for landlords. Um, it may not come as a surprise to say the legislative environment in, in the state at the moment makes it a little difficult to make that a hard and fast requirement. Um, so what we have been thinking about a lot are ways to incentivize landlords. Um, and in fact, I just came across a pilot program in Charlottesville that um, offers to cover the cost in full of energy efficiency upgrades, like a list of energy efficiency upgrades for a rental property in return for that rental property agreeing to accept Section 8 vouchers, right? And we know that that housing stocks, it's, it's hard to speak in generalities, but that often is the housing stock that needs the most intervention, right? And so this is a potential way of incentivizing increased energy efficiency um, without driving up the cost of those rents and actually also meeting another need in the community. You may recall from um, a previous legislative session last year, cities were forbidden from requiring landlords to take Section 8 vouchers. So a program like this could be a potential win-win, right? We're creating an incentive to take those vouchers by increasing the value of the property and we're also increasing the energy efficiency. So um, I, I found it, I sent an email right off to our folks who work with those programs and said, let's sit down and take a closer look at this. So it's 
early days, I mean, I'm talking about something I have only recently come across, but I will say that is the kind of thing we are always looking for and trying to think about bringing to Iowa City. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say, going back to the energy audit, we actually did one on our house. Our house was built in 1882, so very old. Um, it did flag a lot of the things that you would expect in an old house, so attic and basement. It also caught, like, a really minuscule gas leak that, like, mm. we even had someone come over, and they're like, I don't even know how they caught that. Um, but it was really interesting. I don't have that. It's my husband that has the full summary, but we found a lot of use in it. That's so, awesome. yeah. Um, and I guess kind of bouncing off that, have we, I guess – thinking of potentially maybe a targeted approach towards kind of our older homes. Have we ever thought of like having like a mailer or a flyer we can pass out to older homes of like you waste, they're not the most energy efficient homes and maybe list resources that our homeowners can look into to think about our those specific needs that might need to be addressed by owning an older home and wanting to make it more energy efficient. I don't know if that's. I, I can honestly say it's, um, it's not, we haven't looked into doing a flyer or a mailer, but certainly we would be very open to having that conversation with you all and helping develop it. And then hopefully that could be a targeted approach um, should we do an energy blitz in the Longfellow neighborhood. I will say, for example, one of the reasons we've held off doing an energy blitz in that neighborhood is because we know those houses have very specific needs, right? That um, the energy kits we've been distributing thus far may not adequately address. Yeah. And but I we think would like to get in there. Yeah, I just think a lot of times um, these homeowners that are buying these older homes just don't necessarily walk in realizing kind of the energy efficiency needs are going to be so different compared to more modern homes. Um, and then I think that's why sometimes we hear a lot of people being like, well, if I could just replace the windows, you know, I'm going to make mm -hmm. my home more like energy efficient. And you're like, no, there's so much you could be looking at and so much you could be targeting and really small things can also help as well. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And you mentioned that you do provide a grant to income qualified candidates. Um, it seems like the historic districts in that mission is a very similarly needy demographic. Mm -hmm. It is a slightly tougher sell, I will say, with um, sure. the pool of funds we have to, I, I agree the houses are needy, um, but if they're very high value homes, it gets a little harder for us to justify giving a grant. Um, that's actually part of the reason why we are um, being fairly aggressive in our messaging around the IRA incentives, because they're accessible to all homeowners, right? And actually, I'm kind of kicking myself that I didn't bring copies of that checklist to hand out to you. I think you would quite be quite pleased to see that um, we list out all the things that can get funding. One of the things that can get funding under the IRA um, uh, are tax credits and rebates for replacing windows and doors, but we list them as an intervention that you would want to think of toward the end of the five to 10 years if necessary, because there are higher value interventions that you could be doing, and that's a lot of the messaging we want to get out there, right? Replace your HVAC system first, does that then attend a workshop at PS1 about reglazing your windows. Does that does those, those windows replacement come? Those storm windows involved in that, or is that just do you, do you know? I just because storm windows obviously was something a we don't regulate and b can make a big big difference if they are high quality storm windows, mm -hmm. you know that are are easy, much easier to mm -hmm. replace and are not, almost none of them are original historic material where a lot of the windows themselves are. Um, I actually can't speak to that. It's a federal program. No, I just didn't know if you knew. It's fine. Not. Yeah, no. But um, our staff actually are meeting with the state energy office later this summer who are charged with designing the rebate program specifically. And I'd be happy to carry along that feedback when we do speak with them. Yeah. Get behind that. Yeah, I think that'd be great. Um, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, I'll write it down. But I, I do think, too, it might be worth um, working with you guys on pointing folks to resources that align with our, you know, maybe next year's, I know we just sent out our, um, we send out an annual letter to all of our property owners that just says, hey, if you're thinking about doing any work to your property, you should um, uh, contact Jessica, essentially. But I wonder if there's a way that maybe next year, you know, we've got a year timeline, thinking about the types of incentives that are available to mm -hmm. historic homes that, that help with energy efficiency. You know, just thinking about those things and the right treatments and maybe just even highlighting the AmeriCorps folks and other things that are just available so that it's not, 
you know, those are things that people can kind of, some of them are things they can do on their own or smaller projects um, that might be a helpful tool um, as we're thinking about doing that. Maybe it could be timed around one of the neighborhood blitzes or something. You know what I mean? I think there's some mm -hmm. opportunities to, to think about that too. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, even like the IRA incentives and all that, pointing homeowners towards that. But just an offshoot of my earlier um, points, does, well, the residential was a pretty large uh, percentage of the city's emissions, right? Yes, it is. And, and, you know, I'm just wondering, does the city track or like to communicate what they're spending yearly per budget um, towards the 2050 goal? What part of the city's budget is dedicated toward? Do they, do they track that? Do they try to track that? I mean, clearly there's a boiler replacement at the power plant. You know, that's money that they have to spend. Does that get flagged as, hey, we're doing this towards the 2050 goal? You know, that's a that's a really great question. Um, I mean, of course, as a unit of government, all our expenditures are tracked, right? Um, and one of the things we tried to do with our progress report is capture spending in other departments that are relevant to it. Um, we can't track it necessarily in, in well, we can trend, track what we spend on our residential interventions. We don't have a great way of tracking what individual residents are spending on their own buildings. That's an interesting data problem. I, I, have, I, I feel like this could go on forever, but I want to. <laughs> so I, every May, I like to like uh, bring up the fact that uh, at our house, we have a, a 1920s house, and we don't have an air conditioner. Um, and we just make it work, and it's okay. Like we, uh, like part of the design of an older, they weren't designed to have air conditioners. So we close it up in the morning, we open it up at night. I just always feel like people could use that reminder. Like if you want to save money or you want to be more efficient, and even if you are running your air conditioner, if you close up the south windows, you know, and the eastern windows in the morning and the western windows in the evening, you can really manage a lot of the heat accumulation. Um, and I just think people don't think about it and they don't really try too hard to like uh, alleviate any of that. Mm -hmm. So I would always, I would love for some kind of just reminder every summer to go out to take a little bit, like maybe make it just a little bit of effort to not b blast your air conditioning all, all summer long. Cause that's gotta be, it's just this like catch 22 where it's, it's creating the problem and then it's trying to, solve the problem and then it's just getting worse and worse. Yeah. Like a snowball effect, ironically. I will say I also grew up in a house that was built in 1882. <laughs> the gingerbreading in the doorways would make you weep. It was so beautiful. Um, and we did not have air conditioning. So it's, a, it's an idea that I myself find very appealing, but I also recognize it's tricky given the varied housing stock yeah, in Iowa absolutely. City, right? Like there's, it's, goes to how differently those houses were built, right? And also I think something we're increasingly contending with is that um, that's great when you have nine days above 90 degrees, but when we start getting into 90 days above 90 degrees, those houses will have been built for a different climate than they currently exist in, right? And that's a, I, I don't know. I don't know what the solution is, but I love having the conversation about it, and I think it's another way of pointing to that all of the above strategy, right? Like, yeah. let's not use air conditioning as long as we can in the homes that are able to accommodate it, and then think about what future technologies we may need. Like a no mo may, except no air conditioner mm -hmm. may, or something. You know, <laughs> I don't know. I can't win that battle in my own household, <laughs> so Godspeed for the city. <laughs> I've only won it because we don't have one. <laughs> Anything else? Sarah, I just want to thank you for your work. And I'm so glad that you pointed out that connection with Public Space One and the workshops to repair the windows. I went to that. It was excellent. It, it was the best. I'm really into windows and reglazing and maintaining them. And I've been to a few workshops, and that was the best by far. So that's awesome. Really good work. Yeah. Oh, that's thank you for sharing that. I mean, we heard it from Public Space One, but it means more hearing it from a resident. I mean, it, 
it means at least as much. We'll say that in case public space one is <laughs> listening. <laughs> but um, no, thank you. That's wonderful feedback. And thank you all. This has been a delightful conversation. I really appreciate the chance to speak with you. Yeah, thank you. And I just, I think generally we're all want to be willing partners if there's opportunities that, you know, that you see or the commission sees as opportunities for us to engage, like just send us a note. Just ask. You know, I think there. I, I think we want to be. I think one of the things. You know, I'm finishing my whatever seven years is on the commission, um, and one of the things that I think has been the biggest challenge is struggling to move information to our colleagues who are like probably meeting in the same room just a couple days apart, mm -hmm. and, and it's just very like it, it. It it sometimes things just don't move around. Things get siloed. We offer to do it. It doesn't happen or someone, you know, staff changes or whatever. So I think just if, if I'm leaving with the message is don't let, let's not have this be the only time we have this conversation, I think is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. um, and make sure that we're kind of continuing to work together on the, where, where things can overlap and we can be good partners on. Yeah, that sounds great. Actually, I was thinking as um, um, an easy first step, um, I'd like to send that checklist that we developed about the IR incentives and would love to hear your feedback on which ones in particular are the most relevant to historic homes so we can figure out how to better cater the messaging when we're in those neighborhoods and homes. Yeah. So, and you should definitely invite Jen Jordan again. She's amazing. Yeah, I think that'd be great. <laughs> so. Awesome. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Right. I think we're on. Sorry, I moved my, I switched to on to item E. Certificates, vice chair, staff, and chair. Sure, we just have three real quick ones here. They were all minor reviews. Um, uh, you can't really see in the top with that. Oh, well. Um, this is 325 North Gilbert Street. There have been some projects on this back area. They've also won a painting ward at one point in time. It's under new ownership, and it was just a roof shingle replacement. Oops. Um, 112 South Governor Street. Now this one is kind of interesting. This house has um, uh, aluminum, probably, siding on most of it, not in this front gable and not on the porch. They went around all of the trim, so we don't think, except for maybe something at the base of the wall, there's not much involvement with the trim, but we had a previous owner that had a little bit of storm damage, and as you know, our guidelines don't allow us to remove all of the aluminum and put aluminum all back up. They would need to repair the wood siding and keep that, and he sold the house instead. And um, the current owner is someone who... Thank you, Richard. Richard talks, talks to me, to me very, very regularly, regularly in extremely long phone calls. He's very interested in finding properties to purchase in town and rehab them. Awesome. He bought, he this, bought one this one, and, and that, that siding will start, start coming off, off on Monday morning. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're going to include documentation of it in the presentation we're making. Um, and then we have another one. This is just a nice little bungalow on Clark Street, and the owners decided on their own that they're going to remove the siding. It's almost the same case. There's a little bit more trim involvement here. And, it, and like the other one, we don't know what happens at the base of the wall. Um, this one does have um, a lap siding. We can see by the porch so, uh, that has uh, mitered corners. Uh, so, uh, so it could, it be, could something be something more interesting, interesting at the base of the wall. We're not really sure. Um, like this one, the owner might remove the metal themselves and then hire contractors to do the repair work. Jessica, I'm curious. When somebody removes that aluminum siding, mm -hmm. Is it recyclable, and do we encourage that? So Richard, the one for 112 South Governor, he's very resourceful and has a lot of time. And so he looked up and found that Peterson Iron and Metal in Coralville will drop off a dumpster in the yard that you put all the metal siding in. They'll take it away, and if the metal siding is um, does not have a backing on it, sometimes it has kind of like a pseudo insulation or a wear barrier or something. If it doesn't have that, they will pay you for it. Mm -hmm. uh, if it does have that, then they actually remove that, and so they don't pay you. They pay the people who remove the backing. But you don't have to pay. 
Correct. So he gives you the dumpster and takes it away for free. What a great tool to put in our letter of like things to do if you're taking, when you're taking off your aluminum siding. For real. I think we would want to check with them first. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> we have some partners, but that is such a, like, I'm always looking for ways to save, you know, some money. Yeah, or just like figure out the logistics. And I, I often think about how do I, you know, like I got a new rug. Yeah. Over, during the pandemic, and the old rug is just rolled up because I'm like, what do I do with this? <laughs> like, ethically, right? right? Like, I don't want to just throw it away, but, like, mm-hmm. like give it away. It's not that great. You know, I got it. It's, uh, I know, I know. it's fine. But I'm, I, I'm saying... Weed it? control. You can clear out a patch of weeds. No, I'm serious. Oh, no. I've done this before <laughs> with Charlie old rugs. Charlie doesn't yeah. like it. Just anyway. do Craigslist. Yeah, I'm sure there are ways. I guess all, I didn't mean to <laughs> solve my rug problem. <laughs> I was just saying I feel like people need, to, like, having a what do you do with it, right? I had, like, a yeah. rule in my house that I, after, shortly after that where I'm like, I'm not going to get anything new unless I figure out what I'm doing with the old first. Mm. Yeah. You know, like, I got to, otherwise it just, shit just, stuff oh, yeah. just builds up. Yeah, nothing leaves our house. Anyway, okay, I have sorry. to say That's that great. I actually literally had a dream a few months ago where we formed a gorilla group that would just go and overnight quietly remove asbestos siding from houses. <laughs> because, you know, if a contractor's involved, there's such... It's $5,000. You know, it's so stringent. Interestingly, homeowners can remove it on their own. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you just have to take it to the get it to the it, land. it does come off very easily. Mm-hmm. And so yeah, in my dream there was this little group of people that just went and stripped it all off <laughs> while people were sleeping. <laughs> I love it. Okay. All right, so we're on the consideration of minutes from April thirteenth. Did anyone have any edits? All right, uh, consideration to approve the minutes. Wagner moves to approve the minutes from April 13th, 2023. Bowman seconds. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. All right, commission discussion. I put the annual property owner mailing on. I don't know if you want to say anything, Jessica, then I'll say what I was going to say. What? Do you have anything to say? Otherwise, I will have something. No, I don't have anything to say. I will, well, yeah, so I do have one thing. Um, I didn't know it went out on the day it went out, and then I got, I've had so many calls, I can't even tell you guys. It's like lots of response. Sometimes I'll go a week with no calls, and I've had like six calls a day. It's been a lot of response. Um, But then for some reason also, I've had a lot of people who said they got two copies. I I did too. Huh. Get one. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So I I emailed City Staff and was frustrated that they sent it out without sharing with either me or us that it was happening. Um, it used to be, we used to write a letter actually and the staff, like we would have to write it and it would go out. Last year they suggested we kind of rework it to be more of a flyer, which made sense to me. Um, but I said like, look, we should just make sure the commission continues to kind of know about this and, and do this. And to me, it's just more of a pattern of behavior of the development services staff, not Jessica, her bosses of just doing stuff. You know, there was a, a zoning amendment related to stork preservation that they were not going to bring to our commission until I basically asked the Planning and Zoning Commission to defer so that we could have a chance to weigh in. Um, you know, it's just kind of a pattern of behavior that I want to point out to you all because I'm soon to be done and want to just remind you to when you see something or don't see something or see something in a way that you don't feel like like, man, I, sh- I should have known about that. Like, it would have been easy just to forward that out and say, hey, commission, our annual letter is going out. Many of you will get this because you live in districts. Some of you won't because you don't live in districts. Um, it was just like an easy opportunity. I mean, partnership and engagement is one of the city's core values. And I feel like often the senior staff that, that covers historic preservation doesn't um, engage with us in the way that I think they should. And I, and I am encouraging you to when you see that happen after I'm gone, to just say that. Don't be afraid to say, hey, we, I feel like we should have seen that, or I wish we would have known that, or I, we should have weighed in on that. Um, so anyway, it just was an uh, opportunity to put it on the agenda to talk about it. And my thought when I got it was like, oh, I guess Jessica sent this out. But yeah. So from my point of view, when I was first hired, you know, I really did not have enough time to be involved. And so the former senior planner and the intern would put out the letter. And it was something where I read the draft and then the commission chair read the draft and 
we graduated from having just a letter to we had kind of a newsletter a few years ago. And when Sherry was on the commission, she was involved in a lot in compiling that. But it still took a lot of time. And in that case, I also still at least, you know, looked at the draft and provided a little direction. But I have always made sure that the sending of the letter and, you know, doing all of the logistics are other people's responsibilities just so that I stay focused on the other ones of dealing with the public and stuff. And in this case, this year, I knew that they were gathering addresses and stuff, but I, you know, it j was just a matter that I personally didn't know exactly when that was sent out. But um, my role with it is usually saying, hey, remember, we have the annual letter. Let's do it before the interns switch, <laughs> you know, and, and that kind of a thing. But anyway. anyway, I just wanted it as an opportunity to remind you guys, Prando, depart, um, not depart, I don't know, share lessons before I'm gone. Yes. I'm not going far, but I'm <laughs> going to be not here. And uh, this is your second to last. Yeah, okay. I've got one more. Not that I'm counting down. <laughs> no, no, it's you guys will be great. Um, okay, anyway, that's all I wanted to say about that. I don't know if anyone else has any other thoughts on that, the letter or anything mm -hmm. else. I had one other thing. Uh, we talked a little bit about, you know, um, voting for chair and vice chair and all of that. And then we actually did talk about it um, staff wise. And we think that actually what we should probably do is just do the vote for chair and vice chair the very first thing on the very first on July meeting. So as the existing vice chair, Jordan should come into the July meeting assuming that she's going to chair that meeting, okay. at least through the vote. If you get, if you vote in a new chair, then we could switch to a new chair. Yeah. But that way, at least, the people voting are the people who are on the commission instead of the people who are outgoing. I don't know how you feel about that. Makes sense. I think that's what we did. Yeah. It's always time. been a little bit weird when we have the chair or the vice chair who are the people who are leaving the commission about how we do that transition with voting for the new ones. But um, that should be able to work. So. And it's fr Frank, have you reapplied yet? I will. Okay. I don't remember the deadline, but it's, it's I just started we can May, look on the May way out. 30th. It's May 30th. Yeah. Okay. And then who else? It's Carl and? Uh, Deanna. You? Mm -hmm. I, I will. Okay. Yes. Just remember, I sent out the reminder email, and I do not plan to send another one. Okay. So you sent but it out I a am, month ago, and I've I am, however, it. desperate. Yes. Well, because, as theory. you know, there's only nine of you out of 12. Yes. And it takes seven of you to be here. And if we don't feel like, well, I guess, Frank and Kevin, chances of your at-large spots being filled are high. But, you know, both Carl and... Deanna, if we lose your spots, we won't have a quorum until we fill that spot again. And then that means just no official business. Whatever. That means that all of our applicants will be waiting. Only cocktails. <laughs> <laughs> the they will be <laughs> super angry. <laughs> so also that means that if you know people in these districts, please let them know to be on the commission. I tried a little student recruitment for those districts that are heavily yeah. student. That's the other thing. If you know college students who live in those districts, tell them to. And I'm being nosy. I think Noah mentioned he's done soon, too. Mm, no, I don't think so. Super soon. They won't, next ones won't be up until for a year from now, then, is the next. It's every July 1st Okay. is a new one. We just have three outstanding positions that have just not been filled for years. Right, and I think it's strange. I thought I was coming on for two or three three years, but it was only a year. And you had explained that. I mean, yeah. And just like, so right now we have uh, Woodlawn, Jefferson Street and East College that are open. I don't know off the top of my head what year those terms end. But if one of them happens to end in 2024 and we take a new commissioner in that position, they'll have to re-up in 2024 because the term is independent from the people occupying the seat. Okay. Well, that's sort of my term because I took over from. Yeah, that's why both you and Deanna are in that situation where you just had a partial term that you're filling, which does technically mean that you could have two full terms 
in addition to the partial term if you wanted it. Oh my goodness. <laughs> What? Um, if Tom Tom Agron. Uh huh. I I, I don't know. The, I couldn't hear you he's really. Busy gardening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so yeah, fill. We need to fill seats and keep them occupied. And um, those of you, please apply again. It does seem like there's like a kind of regular rotation. Of people who kind of come back though, like it, reaching out to former commissioners might not be a terrible idea to try and to yeah. take them out for a drink. It depends. <laughs> I will say that the commissioner on Woodlawn has no interest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> So is, okay, what about, could that neighborhood be combined into another neighborhood? No, it's a, it's not us, it's the state. Yeah. And um, for instance, though, we have, uh, Ronald Street was added to the Brown Street district, so that just made a larger district. Okay. The little Moffat cottages on Muscatine were added to the Longfellow district, okay. and the state allowed us to do that because they were contiguous. Yeah. Hmm. But beyond that, uh, that had kind of gone up in, around in our office, like, can we combine things? But the only things that we could see to combine, I mean, they, they have to be touching. Mm -hmm. And so it's, at least with those three small districts, it wouldn't be possible. Okay. Mm -hmm. If we did a downtown district, we could combine it with Jefferson Street. <laughs> yeah, if you, I mean, that in the middle part between those two college districts is not... There's not enough probably historic material to make that one. Mm, I there there's just a little gap. Yeah. And the stuff that's the gap is like the least historic. There. Right. It's modern. Yeah. Six plexes or something. Okay. Anyway, oh. okay. Jordan, you mentioned Tom. Is Tom in Northside? Yeah. So it wouldn't wouldn't help us any. Oh, okay. He could take my place because I bet he's very good. You're very good. He's done his We want you. Yeah. He won't take it. I, I think he's probably not. Okay, but not Kevin, even you're like at large. I'm at large, okay. and I'm technically actually in the Brown Street mm -hmm. district. Okay. But I've got just the Mm hmm. Okay. For somebody else, too. Okay. Anyway, I think that's enough of that for the meeting. We can chat more. Yep. Mm -hmm. individually and just an FYI the preserve Iowa summit happens the week that we normally publish our packet so I will be out of I can't actually work that week well because the summit will take all of my hours so we'll be publishing the packet they might publish it while I'm gone but I'll be done with it in advance of that so I'll probably be done before Memorial Day with the June packet do you have a sense if that's going to be a big Packet. Yeah, I'm really afraid of it, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that I can get it done. It just seems like the last two have been pretty light, and, and it's, it's summertime. Yeah. Well, and it's all going to depend, because I, don't, I only have one of that four or five applications I'm expecting, so it, and the due date is uh, Wednesday. So we'll know by Wednesday if it's going to be big or not. Right now it's not, but I have a feeling. So. Due date for what? The ap uh, applications, applications for the meeting. For June 8th? Mm -hmm. Good to know. <laughs> uh -oh. You still have an outstanding application that you, we could close out, but we just need information. I was hoping to speak after the meeting. Oh, okay. okay. Well, I think let's <laughs> adjourn so that we can yes. do that. Does that work? And yeah. We have a motion to adjourn? Uh, Sellergren, move to adjourn. Wagner, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody.